So I'm uh, Kim Libreri, uh, CTO of Epic Games. Uh, we make the Unreal Engine, and we also make a little video game called Fortnite. So my, my um, original role on the first Matrix was a technology supervisor. I ran the Bullet Time team, or the post-production of Bullet Time, um, uh, the engineering team, and also dealt with a lot of the uh, facility challenges of building a brand new visual effects company that uh, was uh, having to build stuff in uh, such a sophisticated way. Um, we were actually uh, we were part of a company called uh, Mass Illusions out of the East Coast. But yeah, I was responsible for the tech. That's the long and short of it. You know, the original concept came from the Wachowskis. Even before I started, there were um, storyboards of the moments of Neo dodging the bullets on the rooftop, the shot that we called GR22. Um, and uh, there had been some tests that uh, Mass Illusion had done. John Gator and Nick Brooks and Pia Jasmine put together some early prototype stuff using a still camera array. And... Uh, you know, early on, as we were starting to work on the actual post-production, there was discussions, are we going to do a still camera array or should we do some sort of surface-based machine vision uh, rig, which nowadays is the, all the rage, you know, 20 years later, but at the time it just wasn't, it wasn't uh, practical with the uh, film being at the resolution it was and film cameras being what they were. So we ended up building a, a stills camera rig, but engineered to a much preciser specification. You know, the shots uh, in, the, in the final movie are very intricate in terms of the camera path. So we had to have um, a company that we worked with called Innovation Arts build a very specific rig that would allow us to photograph this stuff. So there was a lot of challenges, you know, not in terms of you know, photographing it, making sure that we had nice, consistent frames, very smooth motion, no flickering. But also there was a, a big challenge in that they, these shots were shot on a green screen. So were we going to do motion control repeat passes on the background or were we going to try something new? And the, the choice was to use photogrammetry with image-based rendering. And uh, my good friend George Pushokov put together techniques that allowed us to put sort of synthetic backgrounds based on real photography into them shots. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like crazy amounts of pressure to make sure that the stuff actually would work out. Um, you know, it was a different period in visual effects. Um, things, it was all about innovation in the, in the late 90s, mid 90s. Uh, when the techniques were to be developed. And I, you know, we had a really, not, not only did we have the Wachowski support and John's um, uh, undying uh, passion for us to getting this stuff done, John Gator, um, but we had awesome connections at the studio. The studio really believed that the movie was gonna be awesome. And they let these you know, bunch of kids at the time, it's, you know, it's 20 years ago, I, I, was, I was a lot younger than I am today, uh, do these crazy techniques that just sounded like magic to them. And you know, even up until the final screening of the movie um, or the, pre the premiere, we were a little bit worried because them shots have a very different aesthetic to traditional cinema. So in the middle of an action sequence, you're going to go into slow-mo with a camera that goes all around the subjects. We were a little bit worried, but, um, you know, everybody had faith and it, and it paid off. But yeah, it was a, it was a tough challenge. You know, first introduction to the movie was through storyboards. The, the Lana and Lily... Um, had had the whole movie storyboarded by a bunch of their friends, including Steve Scrolls. So you had an incredible detail of what the movie was going to look like. And actually, in a way that for traditional film people, storyboards don't look like that. Normally, they're really simple sketches. These were, you know, look like a graphic novel, and you really, you know, you really could get a feeling for what the movie was. Um, it actually, for some people, that turned them off a little bit. What is this crazy comic book thing? I don't understand. There wasn't really a good understanding how uh, comic book visuals would translate to final motion pictures. So we had that. Um, uh, we also, you know, had some previews of the bullet time shots and a few, you know, bits of early previews that uh, I think, honestly, I think it was um, uh, the early incarnation of the Pixel Liberation Fund were the, the guys that put that together with John and the team. Um, and then sort of you know, halfway through the post-production of the movie, we ended up with a cut to show us how the bullet time shots were going to work in the movie. And it was obvious then that the movie was going to be very, very special. But actually, you know, during the early days, it was a you know, Keanu Reeves movie, you know, around about the era of Johnny Mnemonic. People were not into the idea of this movie being awesome. So it took a while to get people to believe. But once we had that first cut sequence, um, it was, yeah, it was, it, was gonna, it was obvious it was going to be incredible. Firstly, you know, my passion, I, you know, I love making movies, I love watching movies, but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I, it wasn't my life's long ambition to make movies. It just happened that state-of-the-art computer graphics was, you know, that's where it was. The film industry was the first place to really start taking advantage of computer graphics. And that was my passion. You know, how do you use computer graphics and mathematics and uh, computer engineering to show images to audiences they'd never seen before? And to me, you know, video games, 
uh, movies. It's kind of the same thing, and especially in this day and age where we have modern GPUs. So I, you know, I felt that a lot of the problems that were you know, massive obstacles for making movies over the last 20 years, we'd solved a lot of them things. You know, we'd, you know, we'd pioneered you know, physically based rendering, uh, digital humans were beginning to uh, get into a decent place, large scale environment rendering, volumetrics, fluid dynamics, you, know, you name it, a lot of these techniques have been established in the movie business. And I felt that the real time industry was a place that you could continue to innovate. And uh, there's an extra side effect of if you're, if you're making stuff that has to either play in a game or an interactive simulation, you have to have a level of efficiency in engineering that we're not normally you know, penalized uh, with in the movie business. You know, if a render takes 10 hours a frame or 100 hours a frame, you know, it's, it's rough because it takes time to get the turnaround, but it's not the end of the world. In real time, if you're not making that 16 milliseconds, you have not got an interactive experience. So it actually causes a little bit more deeper thought about you know, new techniques, you know, how, how can we leapfrog the stuff that's been undone in the past, and there's a real drive to improve the quality of the visuals um, in real time that they're really, you know, movies right now, we, we have this wonderful um, uh, art capability called compositing where an artist is able to you know, polish the pixels until they're perfect. You don't have that in real time. So the actual fundamental computer graphics has to be great and more general purpose than something that can go through the hands of a fine finishing artist at the end. So that was the long answer to, to why, why I was driven to move into real time. You know, people that make the transition from non-real time, you know, film and television work into, into the game industry, um, you know, the things that we can bring is there's a, there's a certain level of process that we have in the film business to try and, you know, what it takes to actually get perfect pixels. You know, how we calibrate our lighting, you know, the, the techniques that we use to make sure the illumination is perfect and materials are perfect. You know, not, not to say that the games industry isn't beginning to drive that stuff forward as we get more and more deep into photorealistic real time. But there's a, there's a, there's a sense of process and details that we have in the film business that actually really benefits the, the games industry. You know, it, it does help if you have a passion for video games. I've played video games since I was a little kid, so I still do, I'm 52 years old, I still play plenty of video games. Um, but um, it, there really is an awesome crossover. And actually, when you, you get the best of both worlds together and the team, a team made out of great you know, movie people and awesome games people, something pretty special happens. And uh, this is an exciting time, so. You know, there's many places in the overall film production uh, pipeline that uh, real time can, can make a difference. You know, we've seen, as you said, we've seen pre-visualization now, pretty awesome look stuff from, you know, the third floor and Halon and many, many more companies using our engine to pr produce visuals and pitch viz that actually looks pretty much more understandable for a film executive to, to understand whether these ideas are going to work and whether they're going to play to an audience. Um, we're also seeing uh, a lot of virtual production where people are able to design their sets and collaborate within a virtual world um, when it comes to, you know, is, the, is that wall big enough? Is this lighting key to fill ratio great? You know, it, it's possible now within Unreal Engine to have multiple people work within an editor session where you've got people, you know, being the prop master, the DP, the art department, the, the, the um, uh, lighting techs, all together collaborating on a virtual scene. So this is great for when you're trying to plan a scene that is, you know, mostly virtual. And it's really awesome when you're trying to make, you know, an, fully animated content. Um, I think that, you know, as our pixel quality gets better and better and better, I think that you're going to start to see um, in-camera visual effects, either whether it's re through removing green screens and replacing them live with, uh, with uh, digitally created pixels in Unreal Engine, or whether it's by using these new LED uh, lighting technologies that people have, have, have seen. You've seen a bunch of movies recently. Um, uh, Lucasfilm have done a ton, and uh, I think recently the, um, the, the First Man movie used big LED walls for, for, for graphics. They don't have to be pre-recorded, they can be live graphics. So I think we're gonna see some exciting stuff there. Um, and you know, what really, really excites me is, you know, people think of uh, a game engine as just a real-time renderer. We're much more than that. We, you know, an, an engine builds simulated worlds. So the ability to, you know, say you have a vehicle change, chase or a spaceship battle that you're trying to visualize in, in terms of real-time, build the vehicles. Pilot them, drive them, find out what cool shots work out, record all that action, and then put cameras around it and, uh, and design your scene uh, in a much more spontaneous, 
interactive fashion than you know, what we've traditionally allowed people to do with visual effects. You know, visual effects, although we can do a lot of stuff in pure computer-generated imagery today, it has become a pretty dry process for the filmmakers. And you know, the idea of walking on a green screen stage that you can't tell what the hell you're looking at other than an actor that is in a sea of green, or you know, you're trying to get the perfect animation on a car in a car chase where you could have actually just simulated that stuff is pretty, is pretty awesome. So I think, I think we're gonna find a lot of varied uses. And we're seeing companies across the whole industry starting to come up with novel, interesting ways of using real-time technology. You know, the emphasis on ours is to you know, make better pixels, make higher quality pixels, uh, so that we can get to this point where you know, classic visual effects can be done in engine in real time. Um, there are some barriers. You know, green screen keying, we, you know, we can't underestimate what it takes to be a motion picture compositor and pull final quality green screen keys. You know, at, the, at the Film Academy, when they're teaching that stuff, a, a great green screen on a live action uh, movie can have you know, 15 elements or 15 components of the green screen pull. Um, we're not going to be able to do that live in front of a camera and do it um, uh, and, and set that up because you don't even know what the camera move is until the camera operator starts shooting. So I think through a process of um, you know, improved algorithms, better capabilities in our engine, um, but also some machine learning, I think we're gonna start to see these problems get cracked. And you'll see within a decade that real-time visual effects is just a standard part of the industry. Um, another thing that is really interesting is if you start to use real-time visual effects towards final pixels, then the, the traditional production art department has to be designing that stuff and building that stuff before they shoot. Otherwise, you know, you can't, you can't do a in-camera in shot with CG elements unless that stuff's built. So we're seeing quite a transition on the, um, quite a transition on the way that art departments are, are fabricated. And you'll see these virtual art departments that are sort of a, an adjunct to the traditional art department building stuff as they're visualizing and creating the physical sets. Obviously, one of the big drives is for realism, the pixels that we generate. You know, we just added ray tracing uh, in Unreal Engine 4.22, so that's just gonna keep improving. We wanna make sure that we can match the cinematic quality of lighting that you would have in a traditional visual effects pipeline, making sure the engine can, um, can integrate into on-camera systems, whether it be live video uh, assists, you know, pumping green screen images into the engine and being able to key them live, or whether it be um, camera data or all sorts of auxiliary data systems that exist on a set driving the real-time visuals. Now we're trying to do that in as open a way as we can because you know, every production wants to do things different, a little bit differently. Um, no, no two movies are the same. There are different visual effects companies there, different service providers, and even in television broadcast, you know, there's like, I think we have 50 companies now using the engine to do all sorts of cool real-time um, um, uh, broadcast capabilities. I don't know if you've seen the Weather Channel stuff that the Weather Channel, the Future, Future Group did together. It's amazing, stunning, entertaining, you know, it takes the Weather Channel to a completely different level when you can see these crazy weather events visualized in, in real time. So we try to keep the engine as open as possible so that everybody can solve their problems the way that they want to solve their problems. So that's a big drive for us. It's just keeping the engine as open as we can, making sure the graphics capabilities get better, making sure that we, um, we're uh, supporting industry standards, um, uh, whether they be geometry interchanges like USD or trying to define you know, camera input standards for devices on set. You know, we went through that transition in visual effects um, around about 17 years ago, uh, where ray tracing started to get injected into our pipelines. In fact, uh, Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions were one of the big bets on, hey, can we ray trace an entire movie, or are they all the visual effects within a, within a movie? And it was really the enabler that changed. We, it took us from emulation to simulation of physical scenes. And you, we're seeing the same thing is happening now. We've got ray tracing capabilities in the engine. You know, it's early days, although we're seeing, especially in the enterprise space, whether it be television companies and film companies using the ray tracing or awesome you know, car, car um, uh, manufacturers or advertising companies using it. So I think we're gonna see a, a similar transition um, in terms of visual uh, potential that uh, real-time engines can produce because of ray tracing. But I also think for video games as well, you know, it's, um, it's still important when you're playing a video game that you can believe in the space and there's a sense of dimensionality so you can understand how far you know, characters are away from you, where your goals are. And um, traditionally, we put a lot of effort into games into trying to make sure that people understand the path ahead of them with lighting tricks. Now, then lighting tricks are relatively crude in the, in the worlds of rasterization, but with ray tracing, we can get a lot of subtlety and a lot of believability into them. So I'm, I'm actually pretty excited to see what it does for video games as well as the enterprise space.